When a frame comes in on a switch port, the switch has to choose between three actions to either forward the frame, to filter it, which is fancy talk for dropping it, or to flood it, which is fancy talk for send it everywhere except back where it came from. We're going to see all three of those scenarios here in a walkthrough and then in some labs. But to help make this decision, the switch builds a table of MAC addresses, those layer 2 addresses. And as we know, there are two MAC addresses contained in every frame, a source address and a destination address. Now, you might think the switch would look at the destination address first, and that's how this table gets built. But actually, the switch looks at the source address of an incoming frame first, before it even considers the destination. And it's the source MAC addresses that are used to build that all-important MAC address table. Because when we work with Layer 3 protocols, our routing protocols like EIGRP and OSPF, you'll see how both of those protocols are used to build a table of IP addresses or networks. Switches really don't have an equivalent to that. So they need another method of building their address table, which is the MAC table. Now, we could build a MAC address table consisting only of static entries, because every once in a while at Layer 3, as you'll see, we use static routing addresses. Uh, or static routing statements, but the static entries in your MAC address table, if you used only those, that approach would have some very serious drawbacks. Every time a host is connected to the switch, you'd have to make a static entry for that host, which is easy to forget, but it's even easier to mistype. Because a string of numbers, like an IP address, it's easier to type than a MAC address, which is letters and numbers mixed up. And if a port goes down, and you switch that host cable to another port in order to keep that host up and running, that host isn't going to have full connectivity until you add a new static entry for that host MAC address at the new port. And it's also really easy in that situation to forget to remove the previous port static configuration, which leads to trouble when someone else connects to the port. And I've got a lab that's really going to drive that point home for you coming up a little bit later. You'll see exactly how that works when you use dynamic addresses, because it is much more efficient to allow your switch to build a MAC address table dynamically than you creating one statically. It doesn't mean you're lazy, it means you're smart. You are almost, I have to throw the almost in, you are almost always better off allowing a dynamic process on a router switch to do a job like this than taking on the job yourself. That's why we have those dynamic processes. Now, in American football, I should say, they have what they call a walkthrough. The visiting team goes out onto the field the day before the game, kind of walks through a couple plays just to get comfortable. And that's what we're going to do here. It's going to be a walkthrough of how a switch builds a MAC address table. Along the way, we're going to see each of these three frame forwarding actions in action. And we're going to start with an unusual topology. It's going to have four hosts, one switch, and a hub. Now this is a topology that you will not see very often in real world networking if you ever see it, but I'm using it here for a very specific purpose and that is to illustrate every possible frame forwarding action to you. And with no further ado, here's what we have. We have four host devices and for simplicity's sake for our walkthrough, their MAC addresses are their letter 12 times. Obviously when we're on live Cisco switches here, that's not going to happen very often. Hosts A and B are connected to a hub, and the hub in turn is connected to a switch. Hosts C and D are directly connected to the switch. Hmm. Well, our walkthrough assumes the switch has just been added to the network, which brings up an important point, because when you first power a Cisco switch on, there will be some pre-existing static entries in the MAC table. It's not going to be totally empty. They're all for the CPU. And it's going to go something like this. And I know we haven't gotten to this particular show command or a lot of sw or any switch commands yet, but I'm skipping a little bit ahead because I want to show you this table now and the command is show MAC address, which we'll be using a lot here. And this shows you the entire MAC address table. And sometimes we don't want that. We'll work on filtering it later as well. But here you can see something called a VLAN, and these addresses belong to all of them. There's the MAC address, and you don't have to memorize this pattern or anything, but you see a little bit of a sequence going on there from 0 through F at the, uh, at the end of the addresses. Type obviously is static. I think the switch is trying to tell us something. And you can also see the ports are all for the CPU. So your MAC address table will not be empty, but it will be empty of dynamically learned addresses because it hasn't had a chance to learn any dynamic addresses yet. That's what our walkthrough is going to show us. 
Now, to start it off, we're going to see how the switch handles dynamic MAC address learning as host A is going to send a frame to host C. And what happens here is the frame will go through the hub and arrive at the switch on fast ethernet 0 slash 1, which I'll probably refer to as ports 1, 2, and 3. You can see I put the numbers on this one. The hub is connected to fast ethernet 0, 1 on the switch. Host C is connected directly to fast ethernet 0 slash 2 and host D is connected directly to fast ethernet 0 slash 3. Frame comes in on 0 slash 1, which I will now call port 1 on the, on the switch. And you see the source and destination. The source is host A and the destination is the all C's address. The switch at this point looks at the source MAC address and asks itself one question. Do I have an entry for this address in my MAC address table? Well, right now the switch doesn't have any dynamic entry, so it's going to look at that and say, okay, I need to make an entry for this all A's MAC address. And that's what it will do. And it will reflect the port, just like we saw here when you see type and port CPU, what you'll actually see here are numbers. And I'm going to have something on the board for you in a moment. You won't have to memorize all this. Actually, here's, an, here's the entry right now. And it would look just like this. There's the MAC address of all A's. The type is dynamic and the port fast ethernet 0 slash 1. So the switch has begun building its MAC address table before it even starts forwarding that frame or making a decision of any kind. It looked at the source MAC address of the incoming frame to do that. So now, let me go back a bit. The destination is the all C's address. And the switch has to make a decision, what do I do with this frame with the destination of all C's? And those choices, again, forward it, filter it, which means to drop it, or to flood it, which is to send it out every port except that from whence it came. Well, when this decision comes up, the switch now looks at the destination MAC address and says to itself, do I have an entry for this address in my MAC table? And the answer still here is no. So the switch in this case would flood the frame. A copy of that frame is going to be sent out every single switch port except the port the frame came in on. And this is an unusual, not an unusual case, it happens a lot when you first power on a switch or you first add a host to the network. This is an unknown unicast frame. And that's kind of an odd name because my first thought when I saw it was, well, if it's unicast, if it's just going to one place, how can that place be unknown? Well, the frame is a unicast. It's destined for one host in particular. We know that's host C. But the port that leads directly to that destination is unknown by the switch. So this is our result. That frame came in on port 1. The switch looked at the source, added the all A's address to its MAC address table, then had to decide what to do with it, and it decided to flood it because it did not have an entry for the all C's MAC address. Now, the good news here is the frame is going to get where it needs to get. The bad news is it's going to get to a lot of other places that it doesn't need to get. Just imagine if we had 64, port, 64 ports on this switch and we had a host connected to every single one. Then we got 63 broadcast frames that are going to leave that switch, 62 actually with that hub. And how many of them are actually needed? One. So the thing is though, with this flooding, it sounds terrible. And if it continued, it would be terrible. But there's really nothing wrong with some frame flooding as a host or a switch is added to the network. Because the initial flooding can't actually be helped until the switch builds its MAC address table up. Then the flooding is going to continue. But if things go as they should, that flooding is going to slow very quickly as that MAC address table is built. As we'll see when host C sends a frame back to host A at the beginning of the very next video.